college football. I've been watching it for 40 years. Are you kidding me? You're listening to Winning Cures Everything. Game day, baby. Wake up or get out. Here's your host. A confident young man. A superb athlete. Gary Seegers. Welcome in. Winning Cures Everything. It is the Thursday, December 8th edition of the show. I am your host, Gary Seegers. You can follow me on Twitter at GaryWCE. Hopefully everybody's having a good week, a good first week of Transfer Portal, etc. Uh, we have got a lot to discuss today. Uh, so let me go on and run through this thing. Uh, we are going to talk Army-Navy. We are going to talk uh, all of the coaching changes. We're going to talk some transfer portal. We're going to talk NCAA stuff. Uh, the Big 12 and the Pac-12 commissioner both making statements, etc. Uh, we're going to talk Heisman finally. We're, we're, we're hitting all of it today. So each topic will get, you know, just a, a nice little blurb right there. So hopefully all of you are prepared for that. Let me go on and tell you first. The show is brought to you by BetUS. That is America's premier online sportsbook. They are America's favorite sportsbook since 1994. There is a link in the description. If you will click on that, you can get a $50 free play with no deposit required. All you got to do is sign up. They're going to give you $50 to bet with. Go ahead and check it out. BetUS.com. It's where the game begins. I host the BetUS College Football Show every Tuesday and Wednesday, 1 p.m. Eastern time over on YouTube. That's right. There's also a podcast. The links are all in the description. You can go ahead and click that and make sure that you get subscribed over there. Uh, we have got a lot to talk about. Um, all right, so college football, pick them. Uh, what I do here on Winning Cures Everything, look, championship week went 9-2 and two against the number. That ain't too bad. That ain't too bad. It brings us up to a total of 88-77. and 77. So that is okay. I will certainly roll with that. Uh, 88 and 77 is okay. Uh, it, going nine and two last week certainly helped things out. <laughs> I will. I will certainly say that. All right, let's go on and hit this first. Let's go on and do this. Navy is a two and a half point favorite over Army. The total sits at 32 and a half. This one's at 3 p.m. Eastern time on CBS. Those lines, of course, at courtesy of BetUS. Let's go on and pull it up on your screen. We'll do a quick breakdown of this so that you can see what we're looking at. This is the stats over the past five weeks. I am going to ride with Army here. Now, I don't necessarily like the matchup, uh, but the reason why I'm going to ride with Army, and I know that the bets have all come in on the opposite side of me, everybody is, because Army was favored, and now Navy is out to a two-and-a-half point favorite, this thing could get to three. By Saturday, if it gets to three, I'm absolutely placing a uh, a bet on Army. But I I think that Army overall is more equipped to be able to score on Navy uh, than Navy is to be able to score on Army. Uh, you you look at so PPA per pass, at number twelve in the country for Navy over the past uh, uh, five well six weeks at this point. Um, the the Army defense is number seventy three. I get that, but neither one of these teams has to defend the pass or actually passes it on offense. So there's not a whole lot that you have to worry with here. Uh, this is one of those typical service academy games. It just is. You, you can throw out all the analytics that you want to, uh, but when it comes down to it, like my numbers have Army opponent adjusted favored in this game, and they're catching points. Uh, my projected total here is 34.66. That is over the 32.5. Yes, I know that this game has gone under in 16 consecutive games, but did you know that nine of those games would have gone over this year's total? Something to pay attention to. So I'm I'm not worried about the total so much. Uh, I just don't believe that Navy is uh, a really, really good team. The style of rushing attacks that they've had to defend is different then what Army is going to bring to the table. Now, both of these teams obviously know each other. They play each other at the end of the year every single year. Uh, what Navy has done on defense, especially against the run, has been awesome. But when I look at it, like there's there's ways to get around that. So I, I like Army in this spot. You can, of course, uh, check out all of these numbers and whatnot here on your screen. I'm trying to make it where you guys can uh, can pause if you want to look at it. But yeah, 
I'm uh, I'm going to ride with Army. So give me Army plus the two and a half here. Uh, we'll see. We'll see what ends up happening. But that is massive, massive line movement uh, for a game that I think is going to be a coin flip. I'm a little surprised that there's that many people on the other side of this one. All right, moving along. Like I said, we've got a ton of topics to discuss. Jeff Brom has left Purdue to be the new head coach at Louisville. That's right, this has happened since the last time that we spoke. Uh, it makes all the sense in the world for Jeff Brom. I think that he got Purdue to the highest levels that he could. He, he hit the ceiling at Purdue. Now, the question is, does Purdue want to do more? And if you want to do more then you have to invest more. And obviously, they've got this new Big Ten contract that's coming in, etc. Uh, the media rights deal, it's going to provide a lot more funding, etc. That's You'll find out quickly with this hire. Do they go and make bigger names say no, or do they just roll with what they typically have done? A hire from the G5. Do they go and get Tyson Helton uh, to come up behind Braum again? You know, et cetera, because Hilton came in after Brom at uh, Western Kentucky. And it was, and Mike Sanford was there for two years, but you get the point, right? Tyson Hilton's really good. Uh, do they go and get uh, Jim Leonard, of course, that was the former DC at Wisconsin? We're going to talk more about him in just a minute. Do you go and get, uh, let's see, I've, I've seen several that list Chris Kleiman. I mean, that is a Big 12 championship winning coach, a former FCS uh, multi national title winning coach. Do you pony up enough money to make him say no? That's going to be tricky. Uh, Kevin Sumlin, he's a Purdue grad. Has he sat out long enough? Do you think he's uh, maybe adapted to the modern college football landscape enough to be able to go and be successful at Purdue? Uh, is that Do you want to go the retread route, right? Do you do that? Do you do Dan Mullen? He showed at Mississippi State he could win. He showed at Florida he could win. His issue was uh, the culture of the locker room, and that thing just got away from him there. Do you think sitting out for a year and doing TV uh, has maybe helped him change enough to uh, to be successful here? Uh, Brian Hartline, a guy that has not been a coordinator, but is obviously one of the best recruiters in the country at Ohio State. He has seen inside the machine that is in Columbus. Do you want to try and bring him over and, and attempt to replicate a little bit of what Ohio State does? There's a lot of different directions that Purdue can go. I'm I'm very curious. At going back to Jeff Brom, it, it makes sense at this point. One, Louisville, no, I don't believe that Louisville is as good of a job as Purdue right now, and that has everything to do with the conference. Uh, but at the same time, if you want to win, then going to Louisville does make sense. Like, I don't think you're going to be able to make as much money at Louisville, so I guess it just depends on what your definition of uh, the better job is. Is it the one where you can win more? Or is it the one where you earn more money and you have more resources? Like, Louisville has plenty of resources. They can obviously recruit there. Like, it's it's in a good spot of the world to be able to get good recruits. Jeff Brom is going to be successful there, I believe. And when you're going back and forth about which one is the better job, it really just depends on who you talk to. That Really, that's that's just about it. So, uh, cheers to Jeff Brom for, uh, for heading to Louisville. Uh, cheers to a bit of a reset at Purdue. I think they hit a, a bit of a peak this year with the Big Ten uh, Championship, or the Big Ten West Championship, and then, of course, appearing in the title game. I think that was a big, big deal for them. Uh, props to Purdue. I can't wait to see what ends up happening here. Props to Louisville. Uh, the, the boy comes home. The homecoming is complete. All right, moving along. Can Deion Sanders at Colorado really change the Pac-12 media rights value. Now, George Klyovkov mentioned this uh, along with several other things, but he, he said that the Pac-12 media rights had been kind of on hold. The reason that the deal was not done was, one, he knew something was coming down the pipeline for Colorado, and he said that absolutely having Deion Sanders as your coach adds value to the league. Okay, but do we really think that one coach adds adds value like that to where you're not doing a TV contract yet? I, I don't buy that. And neither does Bob Thompson, who's the former uh, Fox Sports executive, uh, for, excuse me, Fox Sports president. Uh, he, he came out and just said, no, there is no coach that is going to add value to a media rights deal. 
just because Colorado was 1-11 last year does not mean uh, that all of a sudden they hire in one coach, and you don't even know what this coach is going to be yet. You don't know how successful he actually is. Yes, he does add enthusiasm to the conference, but it, my, my guess and my belief is no. That had nothing to do with it. Uh, the other thing Klyovkov said is, uh, we also couldn't get that TV deal done yet because the UC Regents meeting has not happened to where they may force UCLA to stay in the Pac-12. I don't buy that either. I believe everybody knows that UCLA is gone. I, if, they, if they do try and keep UCLA in this, there are going to be lawyers. I will tell you that. There are going, it is going to be ridiculous because they've already shown you that they want to leave. Why would you try and make them stay? That is absurd. Uh, the third point that he made, and this was comical to me, he said that TV executives don't do deals between Thanksgiving and New Year's. He said that they basically don't work between Thanksgiving and New Year's. And don't get me wrong. There's a lot of industries where that is the case. You're not going to see a ton of booking, et cetera, being done for, uh, for entertainment, right? Acts, uh, stuff like that. You're not going to see a ton of that done between Thanksgiving and New Year's, uh, whether it's CAA, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of them are focused on sports. A lot of them are focused on other things. But you're not going to see a bunch of tour dates being booked uh, between Thanksgiving and New Year's. It's just, just not going to happen. But when it comes to television, there's still stuff to put on TV. This is a time, it's, there's a reason why ESPN is in the bowl business in this time of year. It's because there's a lot of people at home watching. Like, it's, it's the truth. So, to say that a TV deal is not done because of all of these different reasons, maybe it's a combination of all of them, but maybe it's none of them. Maybe the Pac-12 deal just is not done yet, and the Big 12 just beat you to it. Like that, it, it sounds like this constant back and forth, right? Brett Yormark and George Klyovkov doing this whole, in, in the public eye, which Klyovkov hasn't done for the most part, uh, but it seems like they're going back and forth about who, the Big 12 already got the deal done. But now Klyovkov wants to make it sound like, well, there's a reason why we didn't want to be first to the market. Well, we're bringing in Deion Sanders, and that's going to be worth what exactly, Right. Like, this guy is a brand, and he is going to bring a lot of value to that school. And you just better hope that it's not bringing value to the Big 12 here in a couple of years. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. All right, moving along, we got some more hires to discuss. UNLV has hired Arkansas defensive coordinator Barry Odom, and, and of course, as their new head coach. <laughs> Let me specify. This hire does make sense. And I will explain why, okay? Yes, he's a bit of a Southern guy. He's a Missouri grad, et cetera. He went 25 and 25 in four years as the head coach at Missouri. I don't believe that he got along very well with who was in charge at Missouri. But this guy understands football. He knows what to do to coach winners. It's just the truth. It is Missouri in the SEC is a very difficult job. But if you look at where he was at before that, he was at Memphis. 2012 through 2014, in 2012, the Memphis Tigers, I believe, went either 3-9 and nine or 4-8. and eight. I can't remember exactly which one, but that was uh, the second year under Justin Fuente, if I'm not mistaken. 2013, they turned that thing around by having a really good defense and a, a pretty good offense as well. I believe it was, I want to say it was Danny Wimprine. It might have been somebody else. I can't remember who it was, uh, quarterback, but Wimprine was earlier than that. Excuse me. Regardless... He oversaw a transition from a team that was not very good at all, but you could kind of tell was on the cusp, to a team that ended up going out and winning the conference championship the next year. UNLV is a team that is on the cusp. They are right there, okay? And I know that Robbins is transferring out, et cetera. I know Brumfeld was injured for a, a large portion of the year, et cetera. You've got a good foundation. Marcus Arroyo built a good foundation there. I believe that Barry Odom will be able to take that thing to the next level. He's already shown he could do it as the D.C. at Memphis in a, a G5 league. I think he can do the same thing in the Mountain West. The guy understands how to recruit. He knows what it takes to win ballgames. I, I love this hire for UNLV. It's a little bit uh, different than what you would assume UNLV might have been going for, but that doesn't make it a bad hire. I think this is a good hire for them. 
cheers to UNLV and cheers to Barry Odom uh, for deciding to get back out there. You know, uh, you can you can question whether or not maybe maybe Sam Pittman was ready to move on to a different type of defense, et cetera, because uh, that defense was not good this year. A lot of that had to do with roster. How much of that was on Sam Pittman? How much of that was on Barry Odom, et cetera? Uh, we'll see. But I think that Barry Odom is a good coach. I think this is a good, good hire. Let's talk about Heisman finalists right quick. And the question that everybody wants to know about is, how is Stetson Bennett here? And I think that people sometimes just forget. It's all about what's happening right this second, et cetera, et cetera, right? But if you just look at what happened last year, Aiden Hutchinson was there as the number two guy last year. And he was not even the best player at his position in the country. Like, he was just the biggest name on the best team. And that's what you've got with Stetson Bennett. He is the biggest name on the best team in football. And voters around this country, and there's over 900 of them, they believe that the best team has to be represented in this individual award. Now, that doesn't mean that Stetson's going to win this thing. Uh, And yeah, you can look at it a bunch of different ways. Like, define the Heisman as what it really is. Is it the best player or is it what it's become over the past two decades where it is the best player on the best team? Like, there are some players that just overwhelm it, right? Johnny Manziel, uh, Lamar Jackson, etc. Guys like that that are not on national title contending teams but are so incredibly good and you know that the team would be nothing without them. That's, that's not what we've got here. Uh, USC, I think the guy that's going to win this is Caleb Williams. And I think that the reason why he's going to win it is because you know that that USC team would not be very good without them. The reason Hinden Hooker maybe isn't there is because of how good Joe Milton looked against Vanderbilt the very next week after he went out with an injury. It's entirely possible to look at it that way. Uh, You look at Max Duggan. Like, any other year, other than Caleb Williams doing what he's doing, and Max Duggan would have won the the award this year. I'm still convinced that had he led a game-winning touchdown drive there at the end, this thing would have been a lot closer than it appears to be. But that's when you look at Stetson Bennett, you forget about guys like Ken Dorsey at Miami. Like, Ken Dorsey was not the best player on that Miami team back in 2001. He wasn't even close. And he he finished, like, third in the Heisman uh, uh, voting. Like, Ken Dorsey? Really? Oh, the reason is because he's the guy that had been there the longest. He is the guy that had already won a national championship. Like, go look at A.J. McCarron. It's the same thing. Like, A.J. McCarron was not the best player on that Alabama team. It wasn't even close. Like, that was 2013. It just, you see it time and time again, and it, there are a lot of voters out there that want the best team represented. And whoever's on that best team, whoever the biggest name is, that's who's going to get it. So that's something maybe if if people want this changed, you're going to have to have a change in votership. Now, is it media guys or is it past Heisman winners that you need to pay attention to? Who needs to change in this? It's a lot of questions. A lot of questions. Moving along, we got uh, one more before we hit a break. First round and quarterfinals on campus in the CFP? Now, that is a question here. Um, This quote from, let's see, uh, Brett McMurphy. He said, Big Ten Commissioner Kevin Warren and AAC Commissioner Mike Oresco told me that they are open about having both first-round and quarterfinal campus sites or on-campus sites in a 12-team playoff. Uh, Warren said it would be, quote, wonderful. The quarterfinals are set for bowls in 2024 and 2025, uh, so earliest for on-campus sites would be 2026. And yes, that is correct because the whole deal is going to be redone uh, heading into that 2026 year. Uh, the Mountain West Commissioner Craig Thompson told uh, Ross Dillinger the same thing back in October. Now, Craig Thompson has retired. They are hiring a new commissioner for the Mountain West. Uh, but the point remains the same. When you see this for the first time, starting in a couple of years, it's going to be massive. And you were going to get a lot of people that believe that college football belongs on campus, which I am of the belief that college football does belong on campus. It's just a different atmosphere. It's more fun. It's better. 
and those top four seeds not getting to have a home game, uh, they're not going to be real excited about that after the first time that they have to host a game at a neutral site location, right? It, at a bowl game where the tickets are split 50-50, etc. Uh, when you see these home games, it's going to be mind-blowing. I cannot wait for it. And the fact that we've already got guys on record saying that, yeah, they would love to do this, I think it's great. I think it's absolutely great. So, all right, let's uh, let's move along. Let's take a, a slight break. We're going to talk about the NCAA giving Virginia players more eligibility. Sean Lewis and leaving Kent State. Uh, Louisville offensive coordinator takes the head coaching job at Western Michigan, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but first, let's do this. Let's check out some things you should know about. College football is back, and BetUS TV has you covered. Every Tuesday and Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern, we've got expert game analysis to help you make informed decisions before kickoff, only on the BetUS TV College Football Channel. Visit winningcureseverything.com to find everything you need to know about us, including full shows in video or podcast form, gambling picks, merch, the gear we use, and more. If you want more content from me, Gary, visit BetUSTV.com. I host the How to Gamble on Sports Show and, from August through January, the BetUS College Football Show. You can subscribe to both on YouTube. If you haven't already, subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or whatever's your favorite podcast app. And if your app allows it, leave a five-star written review. Visit the Winning Cures Everything web store to get all kinds of football shirts, hats, hoodies, mugs, and more. Visit winningcureseverything.com slash store to see what all we've added. And now, back to the show. All right, let me tell you right quick about Valtimeri Surf Company. These guys are fantastic. It's a college town apparel company, and they do surf shirts. I'm telling you, they got great designs. I own two of them, and the material is incredibly comfortable. The fabric is awesome, and the designs are great. So go and check them out, valtimerysurfco.com. There is a link in the description. Use the promo code GARY10. It's going to get you 10% off of your order that's right, G A R Y one zero, and you'll get ten percent off the order. These guys are awesome. Go and check them out. Valtimeri Surf Company. All right, the NCAA has said that they are going to give uh, all of the Virginia players that played on this team an extra year of eligibility, and obviously, I do think this is a good idea, right? Because they they had to miss out on Senior Day. Uh, with Coastal Carolina coming into town. They had to miss out on the Virginia Tech, you know, last game of the year. And I I know that obviously this is a touchy subject, but I don't see where they gave Virginia Tech players another year of eligibility. And that's another team that had to miss out on their senior day, that had to miss out on their last game of the regular season, I, it's it's a little bit of a tricky situation. I mean, I, San Jose State had a teammate uh, pass in the middle of this season as well. And yes, the tragedy and the trauma, et cetera, from Virginia was slightly different. Uh, maybe not even slightly. Let's just say big time different than what San Jose State went through. But I, I, I wonder, like, are, are we going to do this more regularly? Are we going to do this often? Uh, it, it feels like they're just handing out eligibility all over the place. I, I'm i not sure exactly how to feel about this. I'm curious, you guys, at, toss it in the comments here. Let me know what your thoughts are on this because I am, I, I've gone back and forth on this. Uh, my wife gets on to me quite a bit about not having enough empathy, and I think that there is a middle ground to where you can have empathy and and also be fair to everybody involved, right? Like, if you're going to give Virginia more eligibility, would you need to give Virginia Tech more eligibility? Uh, Would you need to, you know, Coastal Carolina had to miss a game. You know, I know that they didn't go through the exact same things. I'm just, I'm trying to figure out exactly what the the end point is. Um, You know, I brought up San Jose State, but there's, there's other teams that have had... Uh, things happen, right? So I'm just, uh, I'm curious in the comments, let me know what your thoughts are on this. 
because I am still just back and forth. Uh, I try and think about things logically. And yes, logically, it does make sense to give uh, these Virginia players maybe another season of eligibility so that they don't have to think about this one ever again. But man, it, it's a it's a slippery slope when you start doing this kind of thing. So we'll see what ends up happening uh, outside of just the fact that everybody on the team, I believe, gets another year. Or maybe it's just seniors. Maybe I've read this thing wrong. Uh, but I'm, I'm curious. You guys toss it in the chat. Let me know. Let me know. Sean Lewis was the head coach at Kent State and was an up-and-coming name, has a fun, high-flying offense, etc. He is leaving the head coaching position at Kent State, and he is headed to be the offensive coordinator for Coach Prime, Deion Sanders, at Colorado. Now, I did bring up multiple times this year that I thought that it was a genius idea for Sean Lewis to leave the head coaching job at Kent State to go and be the OC at Wisconsin. That's his alma mater. I felt like that would have made a lot more sense uh, for him because, one, you're only making about five hundred grand. Uh, any big-time Power 5 job is going to be able to pay you about a million bucks at least to be a coordinator these days especially when you've got head coaching experience like that. We saw Dan Enos do the exact same thing. He was head coach at Central Michigan. He left that job to go be the OC for uh, Brett Bielema at Arkansas because he was going to be making a significantly more amount of money. Like At the end of the day, that's what this is. And, And also, we have begun to figure out that it is incredibly difficult to get a Power 5 job by being a head coach in the MAC because nothing that you do in the MAC can really translate over to the Power Five. Now, we've seen P.J. Fleck do it at Minnesota, but he hasn't gone 13-0 at Minnesota the way that he did at Western Michigan. So you're seeing over and over again how difficult it is for guys in that league to be able to make a step up. Like I think the next step up for Sean Lewis would have been either a P5 offensive coordinator position or eh, maybe a job like Memphis. Maybe an AAC job or a Mountain West job, something along those lines, to where you're moving into another tier before you get to another tier, right? That's that's the direction that this appears to be going. Uh, We used to only have like two tiers. There was G5 and there was P5. I think there's a lot more tiers now. Like I, I think you've got MAC and CUSA, and then you can take those jobs and move up to AAC and Mountain West or whatever, and then take those to our Sun Belt, et cetera. And then from there, go to Big 12, Pac-12, ACC, up to SEC and Big 12, or SEC and uh, uh, Big 10. Excuse me. That's kind of what it looks like. Uh, The move makes perfect sense to me uh, because I I think he's going to do really, really well out there. Uh, That offense, and in elevation, I mean, it's going to destroy teams that come into Colorado. I'm very curious how this is going to work. Uh, but I would I would love to see it. I would love to see it. This looks awesome. Congrats to him, and congrats to Colorado. I think you got a really, really good one. Louisville's offensive coordinator, Lance Taylor, is leaving, uh, which makes perfect sense because Satterfield, uh, Satterfield excuse me, did leave for the Cincinnati job. Uh, but Lance Taylor is taking the head coaching job at Western Michigan. I think this makes sense. I think this absolutely makes sense. Um He's a former Notre Dame and Stanford running backs coach. He's got in, or he's got uh, experience in the NFL. Uh, he's, from all that I've seen last year, incredibly creative on the offensive side of the ball. You know the guy can recruit, and that's maybe the biggest thing. He's young. He's going to be able to, uh, I think, relate to some of those younger players. And I think it was time to maybe get some new blood in at Western Michigan. Just uh, some fresh faces, uh, some new energy around that program. And no, they don't have a ton of resources. They don't have a bunch of stuff to work with. But there is a foundation there to build on. Uh, Tim Lester did really good things there. But I think Lance Taylor can take it to another level, and that's really what they were wanting, from what I understand. So this, uh, I think this is a great, great hire. Creative guy, young guy. Uh, everything that, that fit what they wanted, I think this works out well. This works out well. So cheers to Lance Taylor. Cheers to Western Michigan. Let's talk about uh, Dylan Johnson right quick. Uh, He, and I didn't pull it up, 
but I, I might need to. He's a running back at Mississippi State. And he is transferring out of the program. He he put out a statement about transferring, leaving Mississippi State. Uh, he led the team in yards per carry this year. Obviously, not exactly a running offense, but they did run the ball more this year than they have in, in years past. Uh, but this is what he said. First and foremost, I'd like to thank God for giving me the opportunity to showcase my talents at a college level. Uh, without him, I am nothing. Second, I would like to thank my family and friends for the endless love, uh, et cetera, et cetera, da, 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 da. So it goes through. He thanks Mississippi State and the fans, blah, blah, blah. He said, uh, he said, with that being said, since I am not very tough and Leach is glad I am leaving, I will be entering my name into the transfer portal with the hopes of finding a more fit playing environment for me. Now, he called out Mike Leach as he was leaving. And I will tell you, I don't think it matters on either side. Everybody that goes to play for Mike Leach knows exactly what they are getting into, bottom line. And anybody that wants Dylan Johnson to come play for them is going to completely overlook this. Because whether or not you were considered tough by Mike Leach doesn't mean you will be graded on that same level by other coaches. It's just the bottom line. I've seen a lot of people arguing back and forth about this. And, and no, it doesn't matter that he did this. It's great content. It's very entertaining. But at the end of the day, there's not a single thing that he said that matters one iota as far as getting him into another school, as far as what other players will think about Mike Leach. Uh, the book is written. On Mike Leach. You know what you're getting at this point. If he didn't know what he was getting, that's kind of on him. Right? I, I'm not saying it's a good thing or a bad thing if Mike Leach is telling this kid that he's not tough and that he's glad that he's leaving. But this kind of stuff happens regularly. We just saw the Coach Prime press conference, uh, or not press conference, excuse me, the meeting with the team at Colorado. Like, these kids are professionals at this point. They got NIL deals. They got all this other stuff going on. They are treated as adults, not as kids. That's that's the way that the world has shifted. So if you're going to be getting NIL deals, if you're going to be transferring, if you're going to be doing da 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 da, yeah, your coach is probably going to tell you that you're uh, that you're soft. It's bound to happen. I've been called worse. So uh, we'll see what ends up happening. I can't wait to see where he goes because I do think this kid can run the ball. Like I think he's awesome, uh, but we'll see. We'll see. I, I think he's going to end up somewhere that uh, that he can really, really shine. So we'll see. We'll see. Let's talk about Wisconsin for a second. Wisconsin has hired North Carolina offensive coordinator Phil Longo. That's right. You saw the Drake May offense this year. You saw how insane, like how quick that offense is. It's high flying, etc. Uh, this is a complete offensive philosophical shift for not only the Wisconsin football program, but also for Luke Fickle. Now, these two, Longo and Fickle, have had a prior relationship for uh, several years. They talked about Longo coming over to Cincinnati at one point. Uh, this is going to be interesting. Like, I feel like Fickle going into a new job with a new big, big contract, I think Fickle feels good enough about uh, experimenting a little bit with his offense, right? Finding a way to be uh, incredibly dynamic while also eh, finding, you know, ways to score more points. Like, he did a little more of that at Cincinnati this year. They threw the ball a lot more than usual. They didn't necessarily have the pieces. So who is going to come into Wisconsin and run that Phil Longo offense? Who can be accurate enough at quarterback? Who can get everybody lined up quickly enough to uh, to be uh, that fast because that's what they're going to try and do. Like, this is a whole different ball game for the Badgers at this point. I'm excited to see which way it goes. I'm excited to see what quarterback they get in there because uh, Graham Mertz left, and, yeah, we're going to talk about that in just a minute too. Uh, Jim Leonard. Jim Leonard announced that he will not be returning as the defensive coordinator at Wisconsin. And this is interesting because there were reports just a week ago, less than that, that said that he was going to be the defensive coordinator for Luke Fickle. 
like Fickle said that he had offered him the job, and it was reported at a couple of different places that Leonard had said that he was going to stay there, that he was a Badger, etc. Well, then Leonard comes out and says, nah, nah, I'm not going to do this. And what I'm curious about, because it was it was very close to when Longo was announced that, that he was leaving North Carolina, do we think that Jim Leonard decided that he did not want to coach defense opposite of Phil Longo? Now, this is not a personal thing. I'm just very curious because we saw Jay Bateman was a really good defense coordinator at Army. That's a defense that is predicated on not having to be on the field very much, right? Jim Leonard's defense doesn't really have to be on the field all that much because that offense goes on these long, sustained drives. They're consistently, uh, I guess, either tops or bottoms in the I guess bottom in the country. Uh, as far as plays run uh, per minute. They don't go fast. They never have. They run the football, the clock runs, et cetera, et cetera. Like, I wonder if Jim Leonard realized, oh, this is not going to be good. I mean, North Carolina swapped out defense coordinators. They've got a ton of talent on that defense. They brought in Gus Malzahn, who uh, we can question the hiring, and, and et cetera, et cetera. But Phil Longo has never had a good defense opposite him. Do we think that that's a coincidence? Or do we think that maybe that offense going that fast and getting the teams back out on the field that quickly might have something to do with it? Like, I'm, I'm very curious here. Um, I think Jim Leonard has some other options, right? I think there's certainly other options for him. And I think it would be good for Jim Leonard to get away from Wisconsin to try and do something a little different. Now, obviously, there's a lot of people that are already shouting for him to go be the new head coach at Purdue. Maybe you go be a defensive coordinator somewhere else for a little while and learn under some other head coaches other than Paul Christ and people that have been at Wisconsin. At, at the end of the day, I think that's the smartest thing for anybody. Expand your horizons. That's the smartest thing you could possibly do uh, in a career path like this. Be prepared for everything. Be willing to adapt to anything. Uh, we'll see what Jim Leonard does, but I hope the best for him. But I'm, I'm very curious if he knew about that Phil Longo thing or if this really is just him deciding, eh, I, I think I would like to try something else. Like, obviously, the guy can coach defense. I would like to go get ideas from other coaches as well. Just a thought. All right, so along with that, uh, before we hit another break right quick, Drake May. Boy, that didn't take very long, did it? Drake May announced he is staying at North Carolina. Now, obviously, there were rumors before uh, all over message boards, etc., from as early as the middle of the season that, yeah, when the season is over, he's going to transfer to Alabama, and then there started being rumors about he's going to transfer to Ohio State, etc. There were all these rumors about he wants to win a national title, and you can't do that with this defense, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then, which I, I didn't take any of this crap seriously until Phil Longo decided to leave North Carolina and head over to Wisconsin. When that happened, I I tweeted out immediately, ah, it might be time. This is when we need to uh, pay attention to the Drake May watch. And within an hour, I believe it was, he said, I, I'm never, I can't leave this place. Rumors completely shut down. Cheers to him. Now remember, the May family is basically a legacy in Chapel Hill. Uh, the dad played quarterback there. The brother was on a Final Four team there. Like, it, he hit a game-winning shot in, like, the Sweet 16 or the Elite Eight or whatever it was. Like, this, it makes sense for him to stay at North Carolina. And now what I'm curious about is what is he going to look like in whatever this new offense is? Because we have seen this happen before. Everybody watched Brennan Armstrong last year when Robert and I was there and Jason Beck, the, uh, the quarterback's coach at Virginia, so long as those coaches were there, Brennan Armstrong looked like an absolute stud. He was a day one, day two quarterback, whatever it was. He's having to transfer now because I don't know that he would be drafted in the NFL this year because of what that offense looked like under Tony Elliott. Now, I know that there's been a lot of stuff happening at Virginia. I'm not getting into the off-the-field stuff. What I'm saying is, if you're Drake May, would you really be coming out and saying, like, I'm staying in North Carolina no matter what, without knowing who the new offensive coordinator is going to be? I mean, just something to consider. Just something to consider. 
we got a few more head coaching hires that we're going to hit on. We've got Brett Yormark's comments about the Rose Bowl, et cetera. Uh, We're going to talk Graham Mertz. uh, We're going to talk Stanford, et cetera. All those things on the other side. Uh, So let's, let's do this. Let's check out some things you should know about. Follow the show on Twitter at Winning Cures. And you can follow Gary at Gary WCE. You can also follow on Facebook. Got your own podcast or web show? Looking to start one? Or you're just curious how we look and sound so good? Well, we've got all the gear that we use listed on our gear page on the website. And if you order using our links, you'll be supporting the show too. Subscribe on YouTube to get not only full Winning Cures Everything shows, but individual segments and other goodies as well. We're over 6,000 subscribers, and our goal by the end of the year is 7,500. If you're interested in advertising on a show that reaches over 80,000 unique football fans per month during the season, send an email to Gary at winningcureseverything.com, and we'll put together a plan that best fits you or your business. And now, back to the show. All right, let me tell you right quick about Flow Sports. You can visit them, flowsports.tv, or honestly, uh, there's a link in the description. I think that's probably the best way for you to find out about them. They got 25,000 plus, that's right, 25,000 plus sports matches for you to pay attention to. They got MMA, they got golf, they got uh, D3 football. They've got uh, some really, really interesting stuff. And, of course, championship week, they had the New Mexico State Valparaiso game that was uh, basically just scheduled at the last minute so that uh, Mexico, excuse me, New Mexico State could get to a sixth win. So the only way to watch it was on Flow Sports. Check out that link. Go and check out all the different bonuses, the, all the holiday specials, etc. cetera. Uh, but those guys treat us well. They will treat you well. Go visit them. Flow Sports. All right. Moving along. Coastal Carolina. That's right. They have hired Tim Beck as their new head coach. Uh, Tim Beck, of course, the offensive coordinator at NC State. He was at Ohio State once upon a time. Uh, this is his first stint as a head coach, and I'm a little concerned here. Um, this is like Coastal Carolina has basically established that they are a an offensive team, right? Uh, they've had a lot of offensive success under Chadwell. And then, honestly, before that with Joe Moglia. Um, none, of the, none of the offenses at NC State finished even really in the top half of the ACC, from what I understand. And even more so than that, uh, when he was at Texas, like they didn't do well on offense there either. Like I, I don't fully understand this uh, unless you just believe that he knows the area and he's going to be able to recruit. There has to be some relationship here that I'm missing. This could absolutely be a home run. Maybe it is. Uh, he was able to get. It, honestly, I don't. I think Devin Leary was already there before he got there. But regardless, he has coached good players. Maybe it's just a recruiting thing. Maybe it's just a relationship at Coastal. Maybe it was a panic hire by Coastal. On the surface. This hire does not make a lot of sense to me. That doesn't mean it's a bad hire. I'm just trying to figure it out. You guys, hop in the comments. I'm really curious what you think about this one for Coastal Carolina. Uh, That was a team that was a lot of fun to pull for, etc. Tim Beck doesn't strike me as having the most charisma of any of the coaches that were available. Uh, But also, you know, I don't know that you were going to get somebody better than Jamie Chadwell. So where do you go from there? Like, who would have been a better option? Uh, I'm very curious. You guys toss it into the comments. I want to hear your thoughts on that one. Tulsa. Tulsa has hired Kevin Wilson. He was the Ohio State offense coordinator, and uh, and also he was the head coach at Indiana when they started to make their turnaround a little bit. Uh, but obviously there were some things that went uh, that went awry, I would say. At, at Indiana. So we'll let's look at this. Uh, Wilson, this is his second head coaching job. Um, he's been at Ohio State for six years. So he was with Urban, and now he's with Ryan Day. Um, Wilson's prior track record is a sub-500 run at Indiana from 2011 through 2016. Uh, I think the reason why you hire him at Tulsa is because you know that Indiana was not an easy place to win, and he was able to turn it around there. 
the issue is, like, yes, he's incredible as far as calling offenses is concerned. How much of that offense at Ohio State was Ryan Day's offense? And how much did Kevin Wilson actually learn from him? Because what Wilson was doing at Indiana back in the early 2010s was pretty innovative. But a lot has changed in the last five years, uh, since, or I guess six years, since he has been at Ohio State. But how much of that, again, is Ryan Day? How much of that is, you know, Kevin Wilson? Like, I, I'm, I'm very curious about this one as well. Uh, I don't know how many Tulsa ties Kevin Wilson really has. Obviously, there has to be some kind of a relationship here, I would imagine. Uh, the guy was pretty good at Indiana. So you would think, since he's at Ohio State, he was going to get a second chance somewhere. But the way that he treated players at Indiana, I mean, it, it's the reason why he was fired. And that obviously would lead to some concerns, and I'm sure that there is some kind of language in his contract that is going to make this contract pretty easy to get out of if something along those lines were to happen again. So this is a tricky one. He could be really, really successful there. We'll see who he surrounds himself with. Uh, hopefully, I would imagine it's guys that understand the landscape around the Tulsa program uh, as far as recruiting is concerned. Uh, but this is this is a tricky job, a very tricky job, and you just hired somebody in that, uh, well, that's been in Columbus, Ohio for the past six years and was in Bloomington, Indiana before that. I don't know how much people in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and Bloomington, Indiana have in common, uh, but we'll see. We will see. Brett Yormark. Of course, he is the Big 12 Conference Commissioner. He had some things to say at his media availability as well. Uh, he came out and said that he was, quote, put off by the Rose Bowl. He does not believe in anyone putting themselves before the sport, which is very tricky, very interesting for him to, uh, to say that because I believe that Basically, everybody in college football is putting themselves before the sport at this point. Like There are very few very few commissioners that feel like they're actually working together on anything. Uh, it's why you had to get... Um, I feel like this might have been like a, a bit of a shot at maybe the Big Ten and the Pac-12, etc., right? Like, it just, it just feels like it. But I think... Obviously, I agree with him because I was saying the exact same things about the Rose Bowl. You better be able to play ball or you're going to get left at home. Like, that's the end of the end of the line there. Uh, the other thing that he said is uh, that the Big 12 uh, will be expanding into that fourth time zone into uh, the West a little bit eventually. It basically, in due time, it's going to happen uh, because that is their biggest goal is to add value, etc. Uh, there were... There were some questions about Gonzaga joining as a basketball-only member. You know, he didn't say a whole lot about those. But anytime Brett Yormark talks about expansion, etc., I'm willing to listen because this guy does it publicly often. He will tell anybody that will listen that he wants to get a West Coast team. He wants to add another time slot to what they're trying to do on Football Saturdays. And this year was the perfect year to go ahead and get that thing done. Uh, honestly, he might have done the TV deal a little too soon because they had over 9 million people watch the Big 12 title game on Saturday morning. And that was between TCU and Kansas State. Like, that's a huge, huge number. Uh, the Big 12 has done really, really good and significantly better than the Pac-12 basically all season, even though the Pac-12 has USC, and Oregon, etc. Like it's it, this was interesting, uh, but your mark, you know, him coming out and making these statements about the Rose Bowl and expansion, I'm here for it. Let's talk Graham Mertz for a second. This one's this one's interesting. Graham Mertz has announced that he is transferring from Wisconsin, and he is going to Kentucky. Now, Will Levis is leaving. He's going to go to the NFL draft. Nobody can blame him. Uh, even though he did not have spectacular numbers, he is still considered a top-10 draft pick. Go get your money, right? Mark Stoops at Kentucky has already fired the offensive coordinator. 
it, there's other things going on. The offensive line coach, uh, the running backs coach, like et cetera, et cetera. There's, there's changes afoot in Lexington. If you're Graham Mertz and you're looking for a school to kind of rehab your image, somebody that's going to give you not only an opportunity to win, but an opportunity to develop into a possible professional football player, would you not want to know who's going to call the offense? Like, at this point, I have no idea what to expect from what Kentucky is going to do offensively. It, going to, Announcing that you're going to a school that you don't know who the offensive coordinator is going to be or the guy that is actually going to be your position coach just seems odd. That something is weird with, and I understand NIL, I get all of this, but... I just can't imagine that there was a huge NIL market for the Wisconsin quarterback. So this one has left me intrigued because I want to know what he knows. I'm going to be watching this one like a hawk. I can't wait to see what they end up doing. Uh, but cheers to him. Like uh, Graham Mertz in the SEC. Let's see what happens. Who knows? Who knows? Let's, uh, let's finish out with Stanford. Uh, we will hit on transfer portal stuff again next week. There's a uh, there's a lot of it, and there's going to be more coming. Um, but I'll give out like the top five quarterbacks in the portal. I'll give out the uh, the top five wide receivers, et cetera, et cetera. We'll do all that stuff next week. We'll do all that next week, first week of bowl season. All right, Stanford is close to hiring their next head football coach, and that would be either Jason Garrett or Sacramento State head coach. Troy Taylor. Now, Troy Taylor is 12-0 and this season, 30-7 and overall at Sacramento State. Uh, this is the same guy that not that long ago said that he was not ready to be a Power 5 offensive coordinator. Um, or a Power 5 coordinator, excuse me. I, I think he has done a magnificent job at Sacramento State. Just absolutely magnificent job. He has won uh, the Coach of the Year Award for FCS a couple of times. Like, he's... He has done a, a great job in the three seasons that he's actually coached there. This does make sense to me. Now, it seems like a bit of a jump to go from Sacramento State up to Stanford. But I think it tells you everything that you need to know about this Stanford job. They are not going to change what they're doing academically to make it easier on the football program. You're not going to be able to bring in transfers. You're not going to be able to uh, get in a lot of kids into school that you would be able to get in elsewhere. This is a tricky, tricky job. And when you see guys like Jason Garrett and Troy Taylor being the two uh, at the front of the pack here, I think it tells you what you need to know about Stanford. Like it, They're going to continue to have a football program. How much they invest in it is a completely different ordeal. Yes, it is still a quote-unquote Power 5 job. Yes, it is in California. Yes, it is an incredibly prestigious academic university. No, you're not going to have a ton of fan support. But we've seen when they've won in the past, yeah, they have, they've had some fan support. Can a guy like Taylor uh, change that? Can, they, can he bring fans in? Can he get everybody excited? to where they actually want to be invested in this sport again. Remains to be seen. Uh, Jason Garrett makes no sense. <laughs> Absolutely no sense to me. Uh, we'll, we'll see what happens with that. I mean, if, if they end up naming him, I'm, I'm curious. But this is, this is going to be interesting. I will certainly say that. All right. Let's see. There's a new story that's just breaking. Ah, Nebraska is hiring Syracuse's Tony White as defensive coordinator. That's going to be interesting. Probably going to talk about that next week. I need to dive into that. Uh, it says Matt Rule has an affinity for the 335D. Excuse me. 335 defense. Huh. Okay. What a way to close this thing out. Uh, go over to BetUS. Of course, the $50 free play. All you got to do is sign up. No deposit required. You don't have to put any of your money in that will give you $50 to play with. Go and check it out. BetUS.com. It's where the game begins. Check out the BetUS College Football Show, of course. That's every Tuesday and Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. 
myself, Parker, and Kyle would appreciate you giving it a subscription and a uh, and click the like button on any of those videos that you check out. So, with that said, uh, if you're not already subscribed here, if you haven't already liked the video, etc., go ahead and do that. I, I would love to hear from you guys. Jump in the comments, jump in the chat, etc. Uh, this has been a crazy week, and we just hit on like 20 different topics. Whew. I'm going to cut all of these into segments. It's going to be nuts. It's going to be nuts. All right. Either way, you guys are fantastic. I appreciate all of you for being here. Share the show out. Tell your friends about it. Subscribe where you need to subscribe. And that should be it. Let's uh, let's do this thing. You guys take care of yourself. Take care of each other. And hopefully, hopefully, all your tickets cash this week. Thanks for listening to Winning Cures Everything. Make sure and subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. And make sure to leave a nice five-star review. You can follow Gary on Twitter, at GaryWCE. And the show is at Winning Cures. Be sure to check out the merch in our web store and share the show.